Now, can everybody see the, see the screen? Yes. Yep, cool. I can't make it full screen. Unfortunately, it just blows out the screen and it turns the camera off. So you're just going to have to bear with me while I just go through it. Um, so these are the topics that we're going to cover today. I'm not going to read out the slides because you've all got um, very good eyes. So I just want to start off with uh, what is sustainability? And it's important that we do define it. One of the key issues in defining sustainability is the ambiguity of the word. Sustainability can relate to many things, from climate emergency to gender rights and inequality. So it's this ambiguity that creates a need for sustainability communication to be really concise, transparent and honest. So your message is received in the way you intended it. The, just looking at the importance of sustainability in today's business landscape, you know, if you're not talking about sustainability, are you even a business? It impacts everything from your ability to attract customers and employees and even your license to operate. The useful diagram to the right of the screen is courtesy of Deloitte and ex explains the interrelationship of sustainability across corporate business in the world. So I'm going to share these slides with you after today's session. Uh, we'll get your details through EnviroHub, but this is a really good um, diagram that's that succinctly explains those interrelationships. So every now and then um, you come across a piece of really brilliant communication that really just resonates um, with me. So I wanted to share this one with you. This is about the power of having effective communication. Hopefully this works. Are you with? Fun fact. Can you see it? It's 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about yeah. 140,000 years old. Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan into 24 hours, that's one full day, then we have been here on this planet for, drum roll please, three seconds. Three seconds. And look what we've done. We have modestly named ourselves Homo sapiens, meaning wise man. But is man really so wise? Smart, yes, and it's good to be smart, but not too smart for your own good. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes. But at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. And our quest to explore the galaxy rejects and neglects the home that we have here now. So no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens. We willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help wants and signs. Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfires than ever before because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lion's gone, rhino's gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear, gone in three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us in this three seconds. In an existence shorter than a Vine video, we turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much. The only planet in this solar system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned for the sun to real burn, but not too distant, so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best. We are just like this paradox, where we are given medicine for trees, not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family, literally, everything, every species is connected genetically from the sunflower to the sunfish, and this is what we must recognize before it's too late, because the real crisis is not global warming, environmental destruction, or animal agriculture, it is us, 
These problems are symptoms with us, byproducts of us. Our inner reflection, loss of connection has created this misdirection. We have forgotten that everything contributes to the perfection of Mother Nature. Corporations keep us unaware and disconnected, but they have underestimated our strength. Contrary to popular belief, millions are waking up out of their sleep, seeing our home being taken right out of under our feet. We cannot allow our history to be written by the wicked, greedy, and loony. It is our duty to protect Mother Nature from those who refuse to see her beauty. Call me crazy, but I believe we should have the right to eat food that's safe. We can pronounce drink water that is clean. Marvel at trees, breathe air free of toxins. These are natural rights, not things that can be bargained for in Congress. See, they want you to feel tolerance, but it has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can cause a typhoon halfway around the world. But when enough people come together, we too will make waves and watch the world into a new era filled with love and connection, freedom for all without oppression. But it is up to you, yes, you watching this behind this screen to make the effort because time is of the essence and only together can we make it to the fourth second. So that is, is how powerful storytelling can be. Um, clearly, I did not make that, but that was one of the first pieces that I saw when I started my own sustainability journey um, from a, a comms business perspective, and that totally resonated with me. Um, so hopefully it did for you too. Not everyone has got a big budgets like that to produce those types of films, but there are other ways that we can do that as well. So why do we need to communicate sustainably? Number one is, is clearly building trust with your customers and stakeholders is a no-brainer. If people know what you're doing, people sorry, if people know that you're doing great things, then you're trying to make a difference to help them. It, it helps them to trust you that you're also going to treat them in the same manner. Trust is an emotion that fuels our decision, whether we're conscious of it or not. It's that intangible quality that signals reliability and integrity, whether it's a product or a service. Trust is what reassures us we're making the right choice. A really good example of trust is the Reader's Digest Trusted Brand Survey. They've been running this now for about 24 years. Whitak is, is New Zealand's most trusted brand. They won this year for the most trusted confectionery, the most trusted New Zealand iconic brand and the most trusted of all brands surveyed. Of, in of interest to note is that Cadbury is nowhere to be seen in that list. Pre-2009, they were consistently in the top 20, but that was until the great palm oil scandal when the company revealed it had substituted cocoa butter with palm oil. As a public, we reacted really strongly and the company received literally thousands of letters of emails of complaint. And while they did apologize to people and reverse that decision, it's never regained its spot as a trusted brand. So if it's the same applies for a global brand like Cadbury's, you can imagine what it is for us as smaller companies. Brand also helps us differentiate, our sustainability, sorry, also helps us differentiate from our competitors allows us to stand out in the crowd, an opportunity to showcase how we're doing things a bit differently, not because we have to, but because we're committed to making a difference. One US report I, re I read recently said 63% of consumers now say a brand's promotion of sustainability is an important purchasing factor. So I suspect that that would be similar in New Zealand. And importantly, sustainability allows individuals to see whether your values are aligned with theirs. Increasingly, millennials and Gen Z say they prioritize working for companies that align with their personal values. It also encourages innovation. It helps attract a diverse talent pool that are generally more adept at problem solving and trying new things. And of course, it helps to meet regulatory and investor expectations. All right, getting, I'll just have a little drink, sorry. That's a lot of talking. So getting to know your audience, um, just like individuals, your audience needs and wants vary. So it's important that you see, segment your audience. Uh, and segmenting into the customers, investors, employees, suppliers is a good start. And that allows you to understand their individual concerns and priorities. And then you can tailor your message to each segment. An example would be if your company was starting up with a green initiative, 
you might communicate that to your team members as a what's in it for them type pitch. For example, it provides professional growth. It's great for your personal health and well-being and directly uh, and the direct impacts that that individual can make through in community engagement. For example, if you're encouraging them to um, participate in your upcoming tree planting event. But for your customers and investors, you want to show them why this matters for their investment. And that could be anything from risk example, risk mitigation, for example, adopting sustainable practices, we're reducing our potential environmental liabilities, ensuring the longevity of our operations, which speaks to the bottom line. You can also talk about market positioning, consumers are increasingly choosing eco-conscious brands, et cetera, et cetera. Crafting your message. Don't shy away from using technical language and social media but do provide definitions or unpack terms. It's about being authentic. Always provide sources when using statistics or referencing reports and direct your followers where they can find further information and resources, like clearly probably on your company's website in a sustainability section. Don't oversight your claims and avoid clickbait type captions because we're all getting wise to that one. I've just come across, uh, come across a couple of really good examples that I like. One of them is Shane Barr Shoes. He's the cobbler down in Piccadilly Arcade. Uh, you may have seen him on One News and uh, I think it was Seven Sharp. He's got about 40,000 global followers on his TikTok account and all he talks about is repairing shoes. The second one is, I'll just show you a snippet of this one about Patagonia. Uh, Patagonia is a global clothing giant and they've been prioritizing environmental and social responsibility for about 50 years now since they were first founded. They have introduced a self-imposed earth tax, which gives 1% of all their profits to the planet. And that supports environmental nonprofits working to defend land, water, air around the globe and they're really vocal climate activists. Ben and Jerry's is another example of that as well. So let me just click on that. I won't show you very long of this, but it's a very good example. Uh, not the problem. Yeah. You know, the scientists have warned us. It looks pretty grim if we don't do anything. There's a new certification that's out in the world called the Regenerative Organic Certification. And Patagonia has been piloting this for the past two years. Regenerative Organic Agriculture takes the best parts of organic agriculture and it builds on it and says, what's the best practices that we can use for soil health, for animal welfare, for labor, and for farmers? And it combines it into one standard. Uh -huh been missing over the last 25 years. Um, they did it all naturally and they had so what they do really well love the new bangs curtain bangs big fan um love your bangs too but you might just want to put it on um mute oh my gosh I'm so sorry for that <laughs> <laughs> okay. um what, what, what I'm trying to say is that if you choose your niche, you don't have to have huge budgets. I mean, clearly Patagonia have got a lot of money, but by actually showing what they're doing out in the market, and you can do that through simply picking up your cell phone and just taking a little photo, uh, taking a little video and posting it. People like that stuff. It's about your transparency. It's about being true to who you are, which is a nice segue into transparency and honesty. The, the importance of being open about challenges and setbacks harks back to that trust again. It also builds realistic expectation and who knows, it may even provide an opportunity for collaborations with others who are also experiencing similar challenges or setbacks. Using third-party certifications and orders ties into your credibility and helps to build your consumer confidence. And greenwashing, we all love a bit of greenwashing, or in fact, we don't love greenwashing. And reputation damage is an obvious one here, but it can also impact your employees. Who, who wants to be seen working for someone dodgy? And of course, there's always the legal, uh, the chances of legal repercussions and financial impacts. 
You can avoid greenwashing by being transparent, always substantiating your claims and using those third party certifications, avoiding overstating your achievements. If you've done something good, cool, but don't talk it up too much and overstate your claims and stay up to date with what's happening and latest sustainability practices. Can everyone still see my slides? Yes. yes. Good, sorry, just came up with a warning. Uh, one of the biggest examples to jump out to me in recent years of greenwashing is H&M. Um, fast fashion is notorious for its negative impact on the environment. The EU Changing Markets Foundation, um, which some of you may be familiar with, um, said in their 2021 report on the industry that as a whole, 60% of sustainability claims overall were misleading. And leading the pack were good old H&M. They were found to be the worst offenders with 96% of their claims not holding up. And putting that simply, virtually all of their claims were designed to trick people concerned about their environmental impact into buying their products. So think again before you start shopping at H&M. Visual communication we all know the pain of accountants launching, launching huge amounts of data at us and saying, bring this to life. The same is true for sustainability metrics, of which there are many. It's about choosing the right ones to talk about and presenting them in a way that resonates with the reader or your audience. And one of the best examples is this that I've seen recently. This is, I came across this by accident when I was in Sydney visiting the Museum of Contemporary Art beginning of this year. This picture took up the entire wall of this big gallery and it was the population of the world as if it was a blueprint. And with looking at all of those tiny little dots, New Zealand is one of those tiny little dots. We're a mere blip on the wall, but it really is super impactful how big China and India are. Those two countries alone are bigger than the whole rest of the world in terms of their population. So nothing sort of brings that out more to me than looking at on this wall. It was quite staggering. So you don't need to have massive budgets to be creating engaging storytelling. Um, I won't click on this one. It, it takes you through to Facebook, but when I send the, the slides around, you can see them. So Rotorua has a massive problems with introduced species decimating their lakes and streams, and the worst one of all is catfish. So Te Arawa Lakes Trust decided to do something about it, and they created their Catfish Killers Program. They went round to all the schools, and engaged with all the primary school age kids, showed them what the decimation that was happening in the region caused by these things, and encouraged them to get out there and catch these little fish. And now they have open days when everyone comes along. So they've got about 2,000 followers on their page, and they've got a whole bunch of kids that have been going through this program. And some of those kids are now actually going off to study environmental sciences and stuff at high school because this has been such a successful program. So don't underestimate the power of being passionate about what you do and creating content around that. Okay, so everybody just about who's in business has some kind of digital platform, whether that's your social media, your e-newsletters or your or a website. So there's a lot of tools already at your disposal that you can tap into. So the first thing I'll suggest is if you take an audit of all your platforms where your brand is and decide which of those platforms is right for your specific audience. So if we're looking at social media, you might want to be looking at talking to other corporates on LinkedIn and to your community groups on the likes of Facebook, for example. Just remember that you need to have a, cons a consistent tone of voice that reflects your business and your message. Keep things really simple and allow people to find out more by clicking links rather than load, overloading with detail. And just um, don't put way too many emojis and stuff in, in your content. It makes it quite distracting. As we all know, um, our employees can be our biggest advocates and they can, always, they can also help burn us if they're not on board. 
So there's really things, there's a number of things that you can do to engage your employees that aren't cost prohibitive. Um, and if you haven't already, you can just simply install a, res, a recycling and composting station in your office. For those of us living in Tauranga, you've got no excuse with curbside collection. And try and get them involved in community initiatives like um, thinking of the Regional Council's Coast Care Program. It's actually a fun day out where you can go out and, and plant um, plants in the sand dunes or the Adopt a Highway Program. And if you could tack on a day or an afternoon doing something like that onto the end of a strategy planning event, including talking about sustainability initiatives, it helps you get some fresh air in their lungs, reinvigorate them and doing something fun. And of course, you know, there's the old shouting the pizza and beer afterwards, which also helps with team morale. So feedback and continuous improvement is a part that people seem to sort of skip over or if they ask for feedback, it's just ticking a box. They don't actually do things. So it's really important for feedback that it's all acknowledged, acted on if you can. You've got to be transparent and provide regular feed, feedback loops. So for internal audiences, you could create anonymous surveys or feedback boxes if you've got enough staff. You could have town hall meetings. Um, that's where employees can voice their opinions, ask questions and discuss company matters, which is quite good if you've got a really large spread out organization or in use, use your internal platforms, whether that's you're using Teams or Slack or whatever it is you've already got. External, of course, there's always customer feedback forms. You've got focus groups, stakeholder workshops. You can gauge your social sentiment on your social media or set up a dedicated feedback email. One of the things that I often get asked is from a sustainability viewpoint, what are the quick things that we can do to make an immediate impact? Because sometimes it can be really overwhelming when you're looking at all the statistics and go, well, where do we even begin to start? So for an organization, some really simple things that you can already do um, or cost-effective ways is to, to switch to energy-efficient lighting. You can replace your traditional light bulbs with LEDs and you can see an immediate reduction in energy consumption and costs. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle implement a company-wide recycling program, encourage employees to use reusable cups, bottles, and bags. So whoever's doing the, the coffee run, make sure they take those reusable cups with them. And this sort of reduces waste and it also helps promote that culture of sustainability. You can reduce your paper by opting for digital communication tools. You can use your cloud storage instead of physical files, uh, reduces paper waste and associated costs and save trees. I used to work with another department that used to print everything regardless of why they needed to. Um, and all of those files had been there for 10, 15 years that no one had ever looked at and were full of cockroaches. So that's another good reason to go to the cloud. You can also start looking at things like green procurement. And that's prior, prioritizing purchasing products made from recycled or sustainable materials. You can choose suppliers who have sustainability certifications. And this is a great step in having a sustainable supply chain and reducing environmental impact. Um, so some of you may be aware that the New Zealand is implementing some modern slavery um, legislation, which directly impacts those companies that are earning over $20 million in profit a year. So there's going to be some huge penalties tied into that. So it's worthwhile starting to get clean up those supply chains anyway. There's also things like remote work options, uh, allowing people to work from home for a few days a week. This helps reduce your emissions and helps in increase employee satisfaction and productivity and promoting public transport. Um, you could offer incentives for employees who carpool or public transport, uh, walking to work, et cetera, which both reduces your carbon footprint, your, wa your waistline, and eases traffic congestion. And there's always the planting trees or, or start your own green space in your office. If, as you walk down Devonport Road, there's the little film studio that's just back up from where the big gaping hole in the ground is. And that was a, a yard filled with rubbish probably 18 months ago, less, and they wanted a green space. So slowly, painstakingly, they've turned that into a little garden. So if you're in town in Tauranga, have a wander down and have a look because they've done an amazing job. 
So I've put together a whole uh, a bunch of links and things here for you guys to go um, to take away and have a look at. Um, we can talk about some carbon emission reduction. We've got a little bit of time, but I'd also like to see if, if anybody's got any questions. I tried to cram a lot in in a really small amount of time, so I apologise for talking fast. I wasn't sure how quickly all of this would unravel. But if anyone's got any questions, please turn your sounds on and ask away. Laura. Hi there, so sorry about the interruption um, before. Um, I had a question. Um, I think there's an instinct to stay away from maybe negative or fear-based messaging when it comes to climate change from a brand perspective. Um, but do you think that's the best bet from um, for your brand or are there cases maybe where we can use fear or some kind of crisis terminology to motivate change? No, people don't like being waved a big stick. We're seeing that more and more. People get turned off by that type of stuff. Being constantly told off, it just makes you feel inadequate. So where you can, if, you've, if you have got some frightening statistics or something that you want to get your message across, don't shy away from saying it, but don't couch it in a way that you must do better, you're destroying the planet. And I think that that was the difference in that that first video that I showed you, while the message was, you know, holy, we're about to blow up the world and we're killing all the things, it actually was more thought-provoking than you must not. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a fine line, isn't it? Because yeah, it is what we're seeing with the climate crisis is just very crisis-y. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, and there's such a thing as crisis fatigue, and we've definitely all seen that. You know, in New Zealand as a country, we rolled on quite quickly with, you know, we've had the the earthquakes, the mosque attacks, we went straight into Fakati and COVID, and, and people are quite fatigued by it. So it doesn't quite have the impact. And that's when you look at um, companies, uh, uh, the WWF um, and a lot of those children, UNESCO type things their funding is going down and down and down as people just become immune to those messages so it's definitely something to keep in mind oh anyone else it's like a big right well if there's no other questions um we will contact enviro hub and get your details and email everything um, through the list. Presumably everyone had to enter the email um, addresses in there or if you've got any other separate questions, um, please just email them through to me. My email address is meg at shinecollective.co.nz and I will bombard you with all kinds of weird and wonderful sustainability facts and figures. Thanks, everybody. Um, please do provide some feedback. This is the first time I've ever done a webinar, and quite frankly, it was absolutely petrifying. So um, pleased that I didn't uh, drop dead or wet my pants. So that's what my main games were of today. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy your day. Thanks, Laura.